I figured we'd all be tired at this point um, and uh, would need something light. So I figured we'd spend a half hour talking about, yeah, we'd talk about causal inferencing. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, uh, so so uh, here's the thing. Um, we use the phrase causal inferencing, and it sounds big and scary, right? Um, but um, there's that's a that's a reflex that we've learned, right? We all have this sort of um, Barbie doll, science is hard training. Um, uh, my my uh, my wife, who's about seven times smarter than I am, uh, has a postdoc, uh, did a postdoc in Columbia in, in, um, uh, in a uh, F fMRI lab, and she still has some math anxiety. You know, go figure. Um, so um, we're going to take a deep dive on this stuff tomorrow, and I think uh, we need to just kind of settle the issue once and for all this afternoon that this stuff is like nothing to be afraid of. And to, I'm going to prove it because these folks have deep qualifications. I have none. I did not make it through a single science course of any kind in my entire college career. And at, at, uh, at this hour in the afternoon, I am going to sit up here comfortable, not freaked out, understand at least a good portion of our conversation not be overwhelmed by imposter syndrome. And if I can do that up here, then you all can do that from where you are. Um, so um, what I'd like to do uh, is, uh, is start with the philosophy, the liberal art. Um, and Richard, if you don't mind me indulging myself a little bit in the wind-up, because this is literally the only part where uh, I have some modest academic training in this entire two-day summit. Um, so speaking from my hard-won Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy, I contend that uh, philosophy is the most approachable of the liberal arts. And my evidence is that you can find your way, uh, stumble your way, really, uh, in the direction of a decent philosophical uh, uh, insight, even when you're drunk. <laughs> Dude. That suggests an intervention. Yeah, well, I did say hard won. Um, Dude, what if all of this is, like, not real? Like, so, um, I need to get out of that mode. Uh, so probably many of us have had that thought at some point lying in the grass during our adolescent years. But if you've had that thought, then you are on your way to Plato's allegory of the cave. The idea that our knowledge, our access to knowledge of the world is not direct. It's somehow mediated. Um, or to Descartes' evil genius, uh, the idea that maybe we can't uh, trust that we have knowledge of the world at all. Um, and when he pressed on that idea as hard as he could, that's what brought him to his famous statement, I think, therefore I am, right? And he finally got there because if you take the opposite side of that argument, you end up sounding like a line out of The Princess Bride. Actually, you only think that you're thinking, right? So, so philosophy, I believe, is, uh, you know, the philosophy literally means the love of, of, of wisdom, right? Uh, 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 is, is, uh, a liberal art that has uh, that for which educators have a natural affinity, right? But we we get to the first turn in the road towards uh, uh, causal inferencing because um, what you wouldn't know about philosophy as a liberal arts major, unless you happen to take a particular type of philosophy course and a particular type of philosophy program, 
um, is that modern philosophers um, tend to employ certain kinds of formalisms um, uh, to um, express this sort of exploration uh, of the nature of knowledge um, and, and certainty um, that uh, provide a kind of rigor that might lead them down the path toward causal inferencing. And I wonder, Richard, if you could explain to us how a philosopher might end up walking through the door of a computer science department. Well, the first thing I, I thought I'd do was uh, ask if an empirical educator is alone in a forest, he makes any sound. <laughs> Dude. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. It's yeah. the only philosophical joke I know. Um, <laughs> so I got my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh in history and philosophy of science, and I, I was actually studying causation in social sciences. And my advisor, Clark Lemore, uh, at a certain point, about half a year into the project, said to me, you really have to have, make a choice here. Either you can go read a bunch of dead white men and talk about causation in a philosophical sense that no but are really doing practice much reads or cares about, or you can go read social science and statistics and take the chance that we might actually discover something useful. So I, I sort of did the, the second, um, and what it led to was a, a really interesting um, uh, path in which we ended up having to use an awful lot of computer science and a lot of statistics. And so Carnegie Mellon was a great place to be because the interdisciplinary nature of the place and the ease with which you can go visit other departments and enlist their help uh, was really a huge, a huge benefit. So I couldn't resist because Michael's question was leading me into the idea of what are the formalisms which have actually proved useful in learning something about the methodology of causal inference and what we can discover. And they're really directed graphs and probability. And so I've actually taken uh, a few minutes to do like a five-minute primer of the primer of causal inference. So... Um, the, 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 can you hear me okay? So, so the first question I want to ask is, how many of you have been taught uh, that correlation is not causation? Yeah, everybody, right? And how many of you have been taught that the only way, therefore, to get causal knowledge is to, is to do a randomized clinical trial of some type? Okay, so if you haven't been taught that there's only one way besides uh, randomized clinical trials, what other methods have you actually been taught uh, that can get information about causality if you can't do something interventional or experimental? And so that's really what we sort of set about really investigating. But the first thing I want to say is that the idea that correlation isn't causation can be made so easy and so visit, uh, visible if you use these things called directed graphs uh, that it's easy to go further than that. So here's an example in which I have two variables, E and S, and um, I have uh, four graphs that describe the ways they might be connected or not connected causally. So the first one on the top has E and S with no connection whatsoever. E doesn't cause S, S doesn't cause E, and no common cause. And then C is a common cause that I haven't observed. Uh, in the third one, S is a cause of E, and in the fourth one, E is a cause of S. And this little symbol is from probability and represents the idea that E is probabilistically independent of S. And I put green for probability ideas and red for causal ideas to make them distinct and show that what we really need is a bridge. Right? So if um, E has no causal arrangement, a connection of any type to S, they're independent. But if E and S are not independent, which is what that little slash through the independent sign means, that's the same thing as thinking E and S are correlated. They're associated. Right? And the problem is that all three of the arrangements on the right, right will produce association or causation. So if I, if I observe an association between E and S, all I can infer is that there's some causal connection. I know not which. Right? That's the essential problem, that correlation uh, doesn't equal causation. But in a randomized clinical trial, causation does come from correlation. So take the same four graphs and say, well, one of them, or some combination of those, must be true, right? And the R stands for a, a randomizer in which I'm going to randomly assign exposure, which is the E variable here, right? And if it is really assigning exposure, then 
in the second graph in which there's a common cause, the influence that the common cause C had on E will be annihilated because now the randomizer is taking over and no other cause of E makes any difference, has any effect, right, is eradicated. So that is why that X happens. And the same thing is if S is a cause of E and I randomize E, I eliminate the influence of S on E. But if E is a cause of S like on the bottom, then the randomizer might affect E, but it doesn't affect the relationship between E and S. So I've really now, by randomizing, changed the set of structures to those, and now things are completely reversed. So the E sub R means exposure subject to randomization, and that's going to be independent of S, or it's going to be associated with S. And if it's associated with S, the only causal structure that can possibly explain that is when E is a cause of S. So this is a completely simple graphical representation to show you that when you randomize, now correlation is causation. And that's why it's so attractive to randomize. Um, the story that correlation doesn't get you to causation, therefore, is true if you have two variables and you can't intervene to do anything. If you can intervene, you can get causation. And if you can't intervene, it turns out that if you have more than two variables, you can learn an awful lot. And the study that we've embarked on for 35, 40 years with a bunch of other people in a bunch of other disciplines is to really explore that relationship. So if I add a third variable infection and I say, the thing on the right, the causal structure, is really my assumption of what's true, that exposure to something like chickenpox really is a direct influence or a cause of being infected, doesn't guarantee it. And then being infected is what causes symptoms. But being exposed has no direct effect on symptoms, right, that doesn't go through infection. You have to be infected before you get symptoms. So would you all agree that graph on the right is an accurate depiction of the world? OK. So in that graph on the right, every pair of variables is correlated. There is no pair that don't look associated, right? And I'm not going to go through the details of that. But if I look at more than just pairwise associations, if I look at conditional associations, I can end up learning an awful lot. So in this case, uh, exposure and infection are still correlated even after I control for symptoms. But exposure and symptoms are independent when I control for infection. If I know someone's infected, then telling me they're exposed adds no new information to whether they're going to get symptoms or not. Right? So that key conditional independence is sort of the signature of this causal structure. And in general, right, the connection between qualitative causal structure, notice there are no numbers here, and conditional independence has sort of been the key to the domain. And so if I take these three variables and I say, well, neglecting common causes I might have left out, and I'm just looking at these three variables, right, and figuring out there's no direct connection to VNS, so that's a huge set of assumptions. These are the four possible arrangements among these variables. Well, it turns out that these three all imply the exact same set of independence and dependencies, and the one on the right implies this distinct set. So the only difference on the three on the left and the one on the right is that all the structures on the left imply that E and S are associated, but they're independent when I condition on infection, or I. And on the right, it's exactly flipped. On the right, E and S are both causes of I. Now, this is not to be the same example, but you can see that E and S are now independent, and E and S and I are dependent. So this flip in the implications of these structures is sort of the probabilistic signature from causation once you add three variables. And that really forms the basis of what you can do in a much more complicated system. So, there's been 35 years of work on trying to get a general characterization of when causal structure is understood as directed graphs, which is a nice formal object studied heavily by computer science, what they entail about testable statistical predictions that we could look at. Well, it turns out this idea of a causal Markov axiom and the deseparation relation that Pearl and his colleagues discovered give you a complete set of predictions about independence once I, you have a qualitative causal structure. I'm going to call a timeout. Okay. Uh, okay. I only got, I, I got two more slides. Yeah, I'm I'm about three behind you. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think we're getting to the causal relationship of why I never got B past a BA in philosophy. Um, so, um, so 
uh, no, I'm not, and I, I apologize, Richard, but I, I'm, I'm just, um, this is flying by a little fast for me, and, and I want to, you know, the goal here is, is, is to, uh, uh, to get to some, you know, uh, an intuitive level uh, for folks who are slow like me. So what I got from this is that um, if we draw out relationships with arrows, that allows us to, um, to visualize causal relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and if we uh, draw out the relationships differently with boxes, that allows us to visualize probabil probabilistic relationships. And putting them up visually both allows us to think as humans about those two things and then trace the paths. And it's, that also can be translated uh, for a way to com for computers to follow those paths. Well, not... Okay, go ahead. I think a simpler way to think of it is on the left, right, I have causal theories. Yeah. And I can represent them with these graphs, and they're very easy to follow because we think that way. On the right are testable constraints that I could look at as predictions in the data. So what I'm looking at is connecting the theory of the causal structure to the test I might look at in data. It's just a way to actually derive predictions I could test. Okay. So I, I get that in concept. I can't follow as quickly as you are describing them. Well, no, okay. no, and I'm trying to be very just, you know, a little bit, just to give you a sense of what the, the basic idea of the field is. So let yes. me just go, let me go another slide or two and then I can stop. Okay. I don't, I don't want to take up all the time. Go ahead. But the basic idea is we have these causal theories and we now can derive predictions that we can test from these theories. So that's great. If I specify a hypothesis, you could test it. But what we really want to do is go the other way and start with things you could look at in the data and then discover all the structures that might have produced those predictions. So that's what the computer science is. You start with data, it'll compute all the directed graphs, not just one, but all the ones that are indistinguishable in virtue of that data. And so this is just an equivalence class of all the graphs that would explain that conditional independence relation. So to give you an example of how this works in practice, right, we basically took data on lots of different variables in an online course. We took the pretest. We took how many times people printed out modules uh, as opposed to just looked at them online. We looked at how many voluntary questions they actually did and how many they did not. We looked at their quiz scores and their final exam scores, and we put this data through a discovery algorithm, which came up with many, many models, and this is one of them, and I'm not going to go into exactly the other models that you could get. But what this says is that voluntary question activity, right, doing as opposed to just reading, right, has a big effect on your quiz score and your final exam. But what else do you notice about this structure from negatives and positives? Right, if you print out the problems, that's inhibiting you from doing exercises because the people who printed it out did not go back and look at the modules. So this was like, okay, this was a suggestion causally for what we might do to address this problem interventionally. So we told everybody, don't print out the modules, or if you do, go back and do the voluntary exercises. We repeated the same thing in year two, and what we found out was people who were really strong on the pretest in the first year printed out the modules, but in the second year they didn't, right? And the size of the influence of printing out on exercise completion was much, 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 much less. So we got a lot of learning gain, right, from trying to have some grip on what was causing people to do the voluntary exercises or not. Okay, so that was a little hand-wavy and way too fast to go. My apologies, but I couldn't resist no. uh, drawing. We, I couldn't we, resist drawing we, have a, we have a heterogeneous class here. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, an enthusiastic instructor. So it's very clear to me that, uh, that the advanced students got that and were into it. So that's good. So let's back up for the remedial students like me. Um, all right. So, um, so again, what I want to go get for my takeaway um, is that philosophers think about 
uh, how do we get to truths? Um, and modern philosophers think about that using tools like gr directed graphs, which you just saw up there. And even if you didn't follow all of the, the reasoning there, you can kind of get a sense of what a directed graph is and does vaguely. Um, and there is an, o, uh, an OLI, Online Learning Initiative, uh, course on this, uh, right, which is called what, Richard? Well, there are several. One's called uh, Causal Graphical Models, and one's called Causal and Statistical Reasoning. And, and I, I took the Causal Graphical Models course, um, and I did follow that. Um, and, it, and it costs how much, Richard? It, that's, that's free, I think, right? Where's Norm? Yeah, it's free? free? It's free? It's free? How much does it cost if I want to take it twice? <laughs> okay. Uh, two times for, two times. No, half, half price on the second. Okay, price. half price. Okay. Um, so, um, but let's, let's back up and talk about causation. Again, you know, we throw around the phrase uh, correlation is not causation. Uh, is not causation. But let's talk about what that really means and where it comes from and uh, talk about this whole idea about uh, the randomized controlled trials, which we also throw around. And I'm not sure everybody really gets what that means. I'm not sure I get what that means, so let's start with that baseline. Um, so, Amy, um, in, in addition to your, your expertise in education, you, you're also a biologist and, a, and, uh, and an expert in, in medical science. And it turns out that a lot of this language that we throw around and a lot of our standards for, for understanding causality and testing causality comes from medicine from, you know, 150 years ago or so, right? From, and it, it wasn't really, it was that period of time when physicians and, and medical researchers were having sort of the same kind of debates that we have today. Well, do, how, what does science have to say about medicine? Does it have anything to say at all? How do we know what's really true? And how do we know, for example, if germs cause disease? And, and can you tell us a little bit about um, that debate and how just the basics of how they ended up just coming to some sort of protocol, which probably most of us learned in high school science without realizing. I have another slide deck. You want to use it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had enough slide decks. I, uh, <laughs> I, I have a joke about the biologist and the philosopher I can tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought maybe we were back to Marsha and her colleagues uh, getting a philosopher and a biologist going to a learning science bar, and then there's uh, that, that, it's sort of like Not that joke. joke. Yes. That's the joke Ken can tell. I do want to say a little bit about um, and address this element of bringing faculty along who may be glazed over after seeing Richard give that kind of a talk. And one of the roles that I see, even though I am a scientist and have been trained as a scientist, moving into the role as vice provost and uh, joining the Simon leadership team, one of my roles is really to be the non-expert in the room and to say, whoa, wait a minute, how is this going to translate? And I do think that that is really important. We've heard from Kim, we've heard from almost everyone presenting today, that when we really try to change the paradigm, we have to think about who are the practitioners who are doing this work. And I think that really, why, are, why do they have such a phobia, perhaps? And while you might say that that's a fear, I actually think it links to, in some sense, they're afraid afraid of being the non-expert because all of us are used to being the expert in the domain and when you start to translate from biochemistry into education this is a little bit like a new language a new uh, paradigm but when you try to get back to as we heard from Lauren today faculty really do care about students and learning and their ability to do their best job at teaching and I think they care about what is causing students to have problems they're cared about about, they're caring about what am I doing that may or may not be contributing to that. So if you go back to this paradigm of where um, science and medicine were before we understood my, my, microbiology, 
there was that sort of debate of we see these things happening by observation, by inference, but we're not really sure what's causing it. And if you read the history of science, you'll hear some of the ideas or learned in high school about the idea of maybe it was just something in the air or that you were, there was a bad omen that played out. And the more that our observation and testing of what was actually happening um, with people like Pasteur and others, really getting down to the fundamental causes and trying to limit and narrow what that focus of what potentially could be, um, that is where we started to make progress. And as Ken and I were also talking about this, particularly related to educational technology, when you think back to the parallels in science and medicine and germ theory development, it also was related to our ability to be able to see and to isolate what might might be happening. Because like in medicine, education is happening in ways that we can't always observe. We can't always see. We can't always identify the causal agents. And I think that there are a lot of parallels in when we got to instrumentation and the power of that instrumentation got better. And I don't mean by necessarily fMRIs, but just being able to look at where students are learning or not learning, where there's disease transfer where there's not disease transfer, there is the opportunity to help faculty get to that place of um, very pragmatically trying to isolate and use models to um, help to improve their teaching and learning. Great. Um, so, so keeping that in mind then, so help us understand from, again, from a, 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 an educator's perspective, if we're trying to get at what proof means, um, what what the heck is a uh, randomized controlled trial anyway? What is it trying to do? Um, <laughs> we'll get back to you. Yes, we'll get back to you. I know, I know, I know. I. <laughs> Richard, say it again louder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess one thing I want to highlight is the inference word in causal inference, and no matter what technique you use, even if it's the so-called gold standard of a randomized trial, it's still an inference, right? It involves thinking. It involves interpretation. Um, but, you know, essentially the idea um, is we're going to try something different. We want to see if it's better, but... Not everybody can experience both. And if they do, it's in an order. So you're trying to eliminate alternative theoretical explanations and get down to one. That's essentially, and that's where the inference comes, right? You got to think of alternative explanations. And if half the group is randomly assigned to be involved in this better way to teach and the other half does what was done before, the standard practice, and that first group does better, there's very few other explanations besides the intervention caused them to do better. Uh, so that's the, that's the fundamental. So, but isn't it, how, how hard is it to make sure that there's really only one thing that's different between the two groups uh, well, your it's not just hard to make sure there's just one thing that's different. Um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, so the Department of Education funded a lot of randomized field trials in education over a number of years. And after a certain amount of time, somebody did a review. And of 90 uh, randomized field trials, how many came up with a positive, significant, statistically reliable result? Any guesses? Richard says a third, so that'd be 30. 90 out of 90? Well, there's an optimist. Three. All right, now we, we got the spectrum. Uh, nine. So the rest were null. And, you know, we, I think we often rush to the inference when we get a null result that it didn't work, right? That the intervention doesn't work. But if you remember your stats course, you can't prove the null hypothesis, right? What's so hard about these studies is you have to get a whole series of things right 
for it to work. And any one thing that goes wrong gives you a null effect. It's not necessarily the treatment. Maybe your measure of learning, which, by the way, is, to me, it's not sometimes invisible. Learning is invisible, period, right? It's a change. You can't see that change. You have to measure once and later and find the difference, right? And, and you're still relying on that measurement. Like, how many times did you measure? Like, are you measuring the right thing? So, yeah, it's hard to get it to work right. Should we give up and be depressed? No, I don't think so. But I think we should be, we, we have to be open to bringing lots of different kinds of data mm -hmm. and thinking, as Richard was illustrating, about alternative explanations and how, which data eliminates which alternative explanations, which explanations remain, and keep working at it. So, so Richard... Um, if we can't, I mean, what I'm hearing is that part of the problem is if you take the approach of I'm just going to keep everything the same and change one thing, that's really problematic for a number of reasons. Um, some of them are theoretical. Some of them are practical. Um, um, what is, just from a, like, two people at a bar perspective, what, what is the, like, what's the alternative intuition? Like, what is it that you're doing instead? It's, it feels to me like what you're doing is you're looking at not, not just isolating, but looking across a whole landscape of different possible explanations and evaluating them somehow. How are, how are, you, how are you doing that? Well, I think the, um, the, the, the relationship I have on the board now, which is the, the Markov axiom and the deseparation, you know, are the result of 30 years of research mm -hmm. uh, on trying to say what is the connection between the theory and the evidence, mm -hmm. right? And how can we capitalize on that connection to make progress is sort of the, the other side of the coin. Um, you, you know, you're pointing out, I think, um, and Ken's pointing out, uh, the practical difficulties even in the situation when we actually could intervene and actually assign treatment to one group and assign control to another. Mm -hmm. That's still hard because of lots of different things that go, could go wrong. And unless you can control every possible factor between the two groups, and just by chance, right, the groups could differ substantially. And so all you're really doing when you randomize is create one thing difference in expectation, not in reality. So there's another step that's statistical. But the work that we're doing and the work that um, I'm trying to sort of um, get out here is saying causal structure, causal systems have a signature. They show themselves in the data in some way. So if you have a complicated causal system and there's some other causal system, right, that might ha have been true, you can test to see which one is true if you can look at complicated tests in the data. A randomized clinical trial is in some sense the simplest thing. Right. I have two conditions, right? One has the treatment and one has the control. And if I, if I see a difference in the outcome, what I'm trying to do is say the only way I could attribute that difference would be, right, the difference between the treatment and control causally. Mm -hmm. But if there's an experiment I've done in my class and I've said group A takes one treatment and group B takes another, and then I have measures of 15 or 20 different things in between when they get the treatment and when they get the response, the ways, the paths, the mechanisms by which those interventions might make their way to the outcome learning are vast and potentially very, very complicatedly different. So one of the things that we're trying to use this technology for is to narrow down those space of possibilities to suggest future experiments that will more likely give you some understanding about what's really happening in those mechanisms in your data. So when you say there's a signature in the data, it Here's how I would interpret that. Tell me if this is on the right path. Um, there's a whole bunch of possible causal relationships, right? That you're you're making. You've gotten. You've got your list, right? And then you've got students that are going through. You know, uh, uh, your course, and you're watching to see what happens, right? And that's your data, right? Your data is things happening in the class. It's students 
take doing things and the outcomes that are being generated, right? Um, and you're, you're looking, certain causal relationships are, are going to make certain patterns of student outcomes more likely than others, mm -hmm. right? And so um, uh, when you say the signature and the data, what you're talking about is the causal relationships means students are going to do things differently in there. No, 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 I'm saying different causal relationships will entail different things you see in the data. And, and one form of that is the conditional independence relations, but there are others. It's like, you know, you have a theory, an astronomical theory will give you something you can test, right, in the spectroscopic measurements, right? Certain stars or certain stellar formations will have certain signatures you can look at in the distribution of galaxies and the clumping and the other things. The idea here is, will, 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 can we see testable signatures that correspond to different causal structures? So we don't know, for example, if the students are you know, assigned one treatment and they're doing better, whether it's because they're spending more time on the topic or whether it's they're actually learning how to give, um, how to take hints better, how to ask for hints better, how to do all kinds of representational things better. So there's many ways they might be learning. And what we try, what we want to do is to get some way to, you know, build a telescope so we could say, well, if one structure is true and the other structure is not, can we tell from the data which one is true and which yeah. one is not? Go ahead, Ken. Well, yeah. let me try a simple version. So I've got theory A, and it predicts a data pattern, and I have theory B, and it predicts a data pattern. If the data patterns that are predicted are the same, you're screwed, right? You can't tell them apart with the data. But if the data pattern is different, then you go look at the data and see which pattern you see. And if it's the one that corresponds with the theory one's prediction, theory one is more likely than theory two. Trouble is, there might be th theory three. So that, that's where... They're, or or they're, 33 billion and three. <laughs> right. right. So it, it, it does get challenging. I guess another way I like to think about this is correlation isn't cause but they are correlated. <laughs> okay. And with that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so uh, I don't, uh, what I'm trying to figure out is how much of this I need to understand as a non... All of it. All of it. Test yeah. later. <laughs> so, uh, as a like, I'm not I'm not building systems, but I want as an educator to understand when somebody says, you know, we've done causal inferencing and this is, you know, what we've discovered. I kind of want to know, well, what is what does that what does that mean, right? Um, so so I give you just a really simple. Yeah, I, I think the, the the most the simplest connection is. You have to connect it to things you might do. Okay, good. So if I understand the causal structure, that enables me to have some control over changing something and knowing or thinking I know that it, it will result in something different. Yeah. So I'll give you an easy example. We, we, we went to a, um, a conference years ago, and people were, were looking at whether they could predict final exam scores from posting on bulletin board in a biology course within the first week or two. And they could get incredibly close. Right Within two weeks, they could get within six points. Within three weeks, four points of the student's final exam score. So we asked, well, how are you doing this? How, what, what's, the, what's the prediction? And it came out to be the length of the sentences. Hmm. So if you were writing sentences, right, that were on average 12 words, and I was averaging six words, then you were going to get much, much higher score in your final exam. Hmm. Okay, so let's all acknowledge that they did a great job in predicting your score and my score. And now, if you're the teacher, him, and you say, well, Shyness is not doing very well because he's only writing six-word sentences, what's the advice? Take out half your periods? <laughs> Write right? longer sentences. Write right longer sure. sentences. That's not going to do it because that's not the right causal story. So right. there's an association there, and it's worthless to us if we're trying to actually improve learning. So what we need to know is what could we get a handle on? What could we have that we could do something about interventionally that would actually result in better learning. Telling me to write longer sentences, not going to do it. So the whole tool is 
can you get a handle on what would actually help the students learn if they change their behavior? So, Amy, with you, yes, go ahead. The only thing I wanted to add was this is um, hearkening back to an earlier conversation this morning, but I think your point is well taken, and that's why the infrastructure and support for faculty who are not going to just get this right off the bat or want to, but to have the experts who can scaffold that and on-ramp it so that they're getting their own practice and feedback, I think that's another way in which you can get faculty to move in this direction. Um, And so looking at research as, or education as research models where you're scaffolding that with the support of experts can really help that uptake. Great. Well, um, this is um, about half of you, I think, got a, a tremendous amount of immediately useful information out of this. Um, What I hope that uh, the remainder of you got out of this is that um, there is, uh, there's a lot here that is useful to us with some help of our colleagues, right? Um, You may not get all of this. I didn't get all of this. I got some of it. I know more now than I did half an hour ago. And I have friends who can help me um, and I'm going to have another crack at this tomorrow. And I have a free course. It's free, right? It's free? Yeah. Um, several free courses. Half price on the second. Of the year. Uh, half price on the second. Um, uh, where you can spend as much time at it uh, uh, learning. And you can decide how much of this you need to, you need to understand. But, um, but we all want to try to understand what causes uh, uh, students to do better, right? We all want to have a, to try to wrap our heads around that on some level. Um, And there are multiple levels, just as uh, our primary care physician may not have the same depth or need the same depth of understanding uh, as uh, an oncology researcher. Um, nevertheless, um, this is something that um, none of us should be afraid of, um, and we should all tackle even at the end of a long day when we are grossly unqualified uh, to take it on. So I thank you all for your for my, the panelists for your patience with me, and I thank you all for hanging there for a long day. I'd like to tell you that you can all relax, uh, but we're not done yet. We have some announcements, and then we have an expo. Um, and then, and then um, you either get to go home or you get a little break, and then we'll, we'll have more to come from that, depending on who you all are. So thank you. 